Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for Cottonwood. Thank you for John Mark and the passion he brings to his message every every Sunday morning. Thank you for the church leadership. Thank you for our class leadership, Russell and Ken and Don and Brian and everyone else. And thank you for the opportunity to gather together as believers and worship and fellowship uh, in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, I forgot my air buds to watch the Open Championship during the lesson. So if Jordan Speed makes another bogey and I throw my phone, you'll, you'll know what's going on. All right, 202. You know, Russell and I like to kind of keep a theme going, if at all possible. One of the parade plagues today is hail, and this is as close as I could get. So, yeah. church today my son had gone to the British Open and he had a he had a master's pin flag and he mailed it to Jordan Spieth about a year ago for an autograph and Jordan Spieth just returned it so he sent me a picture if you want to see a picture of an autograph flag when we started chapter seven, oh look at this we've got we've got two of my favorite four sons um, they are in the top four and we've, we've got uh, we've got Reagan Freeman, who is AKA Playa, and we have we have Brady Freeman, who is AKA Omega. We call him Omega because he's the last. And had he been first, he would have been the last. And so, but I love you now. <laughs> so no, awesome, awesome young man. We're honored to have you here today. And so when we when we started chapter seven, which was the beginning of the plagues, Brian taught, and he asked a question or he made an observation about why God didn't knock out Pharaoh and knock out his enemies in the first round, because according to Brian, that's the way Brian would run things. <laughs> and um, I think we have the answer today as we go through this, and it involves a 10-round boxing match. But in the scope of the story, this is all answering the question that Pharaoh asked, which is, who is the Lord? 
who is this Lord that I'm supposed to give up all of these people and give up dominion? Who is the Lord that I'm supposed to obey? And what we find is that the way the Lord is manifesting himself is literally a 10 round boxing match. So when I was in eighth grade, I, uh, we had a local Hispanic painter. Um, he was about five foot four, big pot belly, and uh, his name was Richard Herrera, and his son was in my class, Ricky Herrera, and he started a boxing club. And I, had, I was like, how is this guy going to teach boxing? And so we show up, and the first thing, his wife pulls out this scrapbook, and Richard Herrera had been a national Golden Gloves champion. <laughs> And so we had, this is Eastland, Texas, 3,300 people. And so we had about eight kids that were in this boxing club and we would go around to little local towns boxing. And I had about 11 fights and I thought, I'm Muhammad Ali. I, this, is, I, this is my gift, boxing is my gift. And then we came to fight number 12. And in fight number 12, um, in fight number 12, this kid comes out, he's about four inches taller than me, and I don't know how they're doing the weight class, but it's obvious this thing, this thing was not weighed correctly, and he hits me, and it was at that moment I decided this is not for me. <laughs> he did not knock me out, um, but that would have actually been better than, than what happened, and so my mother would go to these boxing matches, and she says that she would sit in the stands and she would cry. And I'm like, why are you crying? She said, well, it's not that you're getting hit, it's that you're hitting somebody. And I said, I said, you need to get your priority straight. <laughs> you're way off. Well, so God has this amazing way in this boxing match with the Pharaoh. Moses represents God, Pharaoh represents Satan. And the whole purpose of these plagues is that God is gonna raise up Pharaoh in this boxing match and he's gonna knock him down 10 times. That's the purpose of what's going on. He actually says in Romans, and we'll come to the story that I've raised you up for this purpose. He raised him up so that the children of Israel and the entire world could see the power of God. That's the purpose of this story. And we started with him throwing down a staff. God had prophesied and God had told Moses and Aaron that I'm going to harden the hearts. We haven't actually seen God do that yet. So far, everything that we've heard is either the Pharaoh's heart was hard or the Pharaoh hardened his heart. And so the Pharaoh's heart was hard when, he, when they threw down the staff and the magicians threw down the staff and made snakes and Aaron's snake ate up all their snakes and it says the pharaoh's heart was hard and then the first of the plagues was the nile as they stretch out the staff across the nile and the nile turns to blood and it stinks and all of this is a slap into the face of the god Dun, Kanun, and the god hapi or the spirit and the guardian of the nile but it says the people's heart remained hard and then we come to last week we have the second plague, which was frogs. And they warn Pharaoh there's going to be frogs, and these frogs come out, and they're in their houses, they're in their beds, they're in their kneading bowls, they're all over them, and they can't do anything. These things that to the Egyptians were a god, they worshiped this god called Hecht, which was a, a lady with a frog face. And they couldn't kill the frogs. These frogs were a blessing to them because they were, in essence, exterminators. And so you'll remember, Moses goes to the Pharaoh and he says, when, tell me, when would you like these frogs to go away? What does Pharaoh say? Tomorrow. He wanted to spend one more night in bed with frogs. And so eventually, eventually, he concedes and tomorrow comes and they wipe out the frogs and they stack them in heaps and they stink. It's stench. And you'll recall that we talked about that being the stench of sin. And we all have that stench in our lives. And then it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. His heart had been hard, but he hardened it even more. 
and we come to the story of the gnats. And the gnats were, in essence, they looked like they were tiny gnats, and their stories about the ground actually looking like it's moving as these gnats are all crawling on the ground, and they strike them. And the gnats come up, and they're buzzing in their ears, they're in their eyes, nose, and throat. And guess what? The magicians who had made frogs, who had made blood, the magicians couldn't make these gnats. And they said, this is the finger of Elohim. This is the finger of God. And we talked about how many times we've seen the finger of God as God wrote on the tablets and says, you'll have no other gods before me. And how he wrote on the wall to Belshazzar, many, many tekel of Parson, weighed or numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. I'm going to divide your kingdom. And how Jesus Christ himself, with the finger of God, wrote in the sand. But the Pharaoh's heart remains hard. And then we come to the last, which is, or the fourth plague, which was the flies. And we talked about how the big flies, the tetsi flies like back in Tanzania would sting and they just, they were just awful. And the Pharaoh's heart is hard. He, he doesn't want them to go away, but he eventually says to Israel, okay, I'm going to let you go but I just want you to sacrifice within the land. Don't leave your slavery. Don't leave dominion. You can, you can be a Christian and not go all the way. And Moses says, no, God commanded us to get out of here. We're an abomination. We're going to sacrifice cows, which we'll learn about today. And he says, okay, I just go a little ways. Just go a little ways out. And Moses says, look, we're going to stop this, but you cannot be a cheater because we know Satan is a cheater. We can't, we're not going to let, we're going to, we're going to rid you of this. Only let Pharaoh not cheat again was his exact words. And so Pharaoh's heart is hard and we come to livestock today. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague on, upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord has set a time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing and all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but none of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. All of the previous plagues have just been inconvenient. You know, the Nile was blood, but they could dig, dig up around the Nile to get water. Um, the frogs crawling in your bed, that, that is a significant inconvenience, I agree, but it's just an inconvenience. The gnats stinging you and flies are just an irritant. But this attacks their primary gods, and this attacks their primary wealth. In 1970, 1970 and 71, my father, um, he didn't have a college degree at this time, and he climbed poles for a utility company. We didn't have a lot of money. Grew up in a little wood frame house. And to supplement his income, we had cattle. Um, we had, he, he would lease um, a property, didn't own our own property, but he would lease it, and we raised cattle. And in 70 and 71, there was one of the most significant droughts that had ever happened in Texas. And there were over 100,000 cattle, heads of cattle that died in that drought. Um, and so the place that we had had stock ponds um, and or stock tanks, depending on where you're from. And those were drying up. And so they were drying up everywhere. And so these cattle literally are being taken as fast as they can to the market so that the market cattle market is just crashing. And so as the cattle market's crashing and the ponds are going down, we would, I remember we were, we were selling them as fast as we could. And as we crest over and look over the bank, these cows were 
walking out into what was the drying up pond and they would sink and drown, they would die. And so we were pulling them out and selling them as fast as we could. And it was devastating financially. The same thing happened on a macro basis in 2008. Everybody remember the financial crisis? So the people, the money guys, the people who sold subprime mortgages and packaged them up and sold them to investment banks, who sold them to people, they were selling bad stuff for the sake of the almighty dollar. And all of a sudden there was a hiccup in housing prices. Housing prices sunk and the subprime market exploded. 700 hedge funds, money guys, 700 hedge funds go bankrupt. Um, 25 FDIC banks go bankrupt. The federal government has to come in and prop up the money guys. The money guys who were worshiping the almighty dollar in this metaphor, I'm sure not all of them were, were worshiping the almighty dollar, but all of their livelihood and all of their career was focused on money and it collapsed. That's what happened to these Egyptians. They worshiped these, these, these symbols that were cows. Let's, let's roll down to Apis. The Pharaoh you see bending down is Amenhotep II, who in all likelihood was this very Pharaoh. And he is bowing down to a god, god named Apis. Apis was supposedly born by a moonbeam. And Apis, when it would die, they believed that it went to heaven and a new reincarnate Apis would appear. Um, they've actually discovered a sarcophagus in Egypt where they have embalmed apises that were there. Amenhotep II was one of the most faithful pharaohs to worship these cows. And they had many others. Go down to Nevis. This is, this is an emblem of Nevis. And this is the sacred bull of the god Ra. And then there was also a goddess. We had a frog-faced goddess. Let's go down. So here is the goddess of Hathor. And she had the, she had the head of a cow and body of a woman. So ladies, you spend all your time putting makeup on and, and lipstick. And look, if you want your husband to worship you, put on a cow face. That's what you need to put on. And so, and so there are there are actually pictures of pharaohs being suckled by Hathor. I don't know if I got that right. That may be inverse of that. I'm not for sure which is the suckler or the sucker. And so um, if we go down, go back up to the verses, if we go to verse four, but the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel so that nothing that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. You know why he's doing that? He's showing Israel what is going to happen. This is the purpose of this is so that Israel will see a knockdown. So that Israel in this round sees God knock down the very thing that the Egyptians worship. And we're going to see that play out over and over and over. And down at the bottom, but the heart of the Pharaoh was hardened. And if you go down to Proverbs 28, 14, down below the pictures. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And what he's saying is the opposite, the very opposite thing of a hard heart is a reverential awe of God, just, just a worshiping of God. Sean? And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out and sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out and sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So he has had inconveniences 
He's taken their wealth and attacked their gods, and now he attacks their health with these boils. There's all kinds of theories of maybe this was leprosy, maybe it was some kind of Egyptian, um, Egyptian skin disease. So we don't know what it is, but we know that these magicians couldn't even stand in front of Moses. They were so, so infected, they couldn't stand. But notice that it says, take handfuls of soot from the kiln. What is a kiln? Baking bricks, baking bricks. So this was one of the kiln where the Egyptians would have forced, would have made, forced them to make bricks and labor. And you remember, they started forcing them to do more and more and take away their straw. And this became an emblem of suffering. This, and so, we think of the emblem of suffering as what? The cross. It's actually in Psalms. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't die on the cross. The cross was a gift to me. I want to imagine somebody beating you every day with a whip. The emblem of suffering is the whip. And God stepping in and taking that whip and whipping the person that whips you, that's what's happening here. The kiln is an emblem of suffering. And this is, in verse 12, the first time, this is the first time that it actually says the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. The first time he emphatically does that. The Pharaoh's heart was hard. The Pharaoh's heart was always hard towards the Israelites. That's why God raised him up. Um, but he ignores God over and over and over. I wish I'd included Romans 1. Um, I'll read it to you. Romans 1.20. Because this is what is actually happening. If you want to go to Romans 1, 20 through 25 in your real Bible. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, referring to God, ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So everyone is without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is almost like it's written exactly about the Egyptians. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so this is what the Egyptians are doing. They're literally turning away. They're ignoring, they sit, they've been knocked down. Pharaoh has been knocked down four or five times now, and he's ignoring it. He knows what's going on, and we know later that he says he actually sins, and he admits that he sins. You know, what is the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy of what? The Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit's purpose is, is to point to Christ, and the reason the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin is because you are ignoring what is pointing to Christ. This knockdown is about them ignoring what's going on. At this moment, when God steps in and hardens their heart, he's given themselves up to their own impurity. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and all your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. 
okay, at this point, this is the hardest warning. He's, he's going to send all of his plagues. He's telling the prophecy of what's going to happen. You're going to get 10 plagues. I'm going to knock you down 10 times. And I'm going to raise you up for that purpose. And what purpose does he say? It's twofold. Number one, in verse 14, so that you may know. That's number one. Pharaoh, I'm going to knock you down so that you know who I am. And then in verse 16 comes the second of the twofold purpose, so that my name may be proclaimed. He is this whole thing in answer to the question, why doesn't he knock him out in the first round? God's raising him up to knock him down for those two reasons, so that he knows who's God and so that God will be proclaimed. Romans 9, 17 says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, so this is, this is really hard. Um, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he will, and he hardens whomever he will. And you'll say to me, why does he still find fault? That's hard. Because he's talking about the sovereignty of God and he's saying, why does God, if God is doing this, why does he find fault in somebody? Who can resist his will? But who are you? Oh man, to answer back to God. What is molded to say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out the same lump of one vessel for an honorable use and another for dishonorable? What if God, desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of his mercy. He has prepared beforehand for the glory. So all of this is hard. This, we come to verses like this and it sounds like God is orchestrating and we don't have free will. But you've got to realize that this is an Eastern book and there are things like this and, and we have all of these, these verses about the sovereignty of God and he is sovereign. But we also have that he desires that no man should perish. He doesn't want any to be lost. We, you know, we, we say, okay, well, if he's sovereign, does he have free will? He has, there is sovereignty and we do have free will. Pharaoh had free will. Pharaoh, before God even shows up on the scene with him, is persecuting these Israelites. And he says they're too many and too mighty for us to battle. And he begins to murder them. He begins to murder little babies. That's where he was before Moses ever showed up. And so his heart is hard and he's hardened. Um, for this purpose, I've raised you up. And that is, again, to show, to show everybody that God's about to knock him down. By the way, don't confuse discipline and wrath. Um, God is showing his wrath on the Egyptians here. God shows loving discipline to us. There are things that we go through that he's teaching us like a parent. And it, you know, he doesn't promise us things are going to be easy. And we have all kinds of things that course correct us. God working. But it's all for the purpose of the glory of God, and it's all for the good of those that love God. And so never confuse discipline and wrath. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause a very heavy hail to fall such as never been done in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now, therefore, send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter, for the, every man and beast that is in the field and not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant in the field in the land of Egypt. And then Moses stretched out his, hand, his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. 
And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Okay, I left something out. You're asking, why are there livestock here if the livestock have already been wiped out? In the first section that we read, what it said is that it would be the livestock and the field. So to the extent there were livestock in barns or in shelter, those weren't impacted from the first disease. So these are the remaining livestock. And it says you're still exalting yourself among my people. And so he's saying, you, Pharaoh, are impeding my will with my people. Do you want to be in that position? That's not a good position to be in. <laughs> to have God and his people wanting to do something and you impeding his will. Um, the hail, I'll look this up. Their record hail is eight inches in diameter. And it, it was two pounds, two and a quarter pounds heavy. So I, I mentioned Omega. Um, one of my top four sons, Omega, was how long ago did you total your car? So four years ago, Omega is driving his car um, and he is going north on the tollway and is going over to George Bush and he gets stuck in the middle of an all hail storm. And he's there up on the top and the hail was so severe that the back of his windshield, the back of his window totally busted out and literally his front window looked like spider webs. And this was a decently valuable car and it was completely totaled. In the tribulation, it says the great tribulation, there's going to be hail and it's gonna be a hundred pounds, a talent, somewhere between a hundred and 125 pounds. I want you to imagine that. And so this hail had to be significant. It had to be more than Omega experienced. And just imagine, imagine taking out peanut, your little peanut into a hailstorm like that. <laughs> it would be dev Actually, that's a great idea. <laughs> right. I hadn't, I just, that just came to me. Y'all remember that and let me take care of her next, next time we have the hailstorm. And so some of these, some of these people, some of these Egyptians are starting to get the message. It said, whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. So some of these Egyptians are looking at Pharaoh and they're seeing Pharaoh's getting knocked down. And they're like, okay, I, these, I'm going to back these guys. I believe them. I believe their God is more powerful than the nut God that we'll see, than the cow God, than the frog God. I believe this God is more powerful. So I'm going to get my livestock covered. And some of these God fearers actually went with the Israelites as they crossed the Red Sea. As they go in, these people, though, began to look back at Egypt, and they ended up being a source of problem for them. But as of right now, they're believing. And so there is thunder and hail and fire, and all of these things are at attacking the gods of agriculture and the gods of the sky. If we could go down, you'll see Seth, the agricultural god, and then you'll see Isis, who is an agricultural goddess, and you'll see Nut, the sky goddess. So they had, how many gods did they have? I've heard anywhere from 40 to 120. Probably more like 120. Probably more like 120. So they've got all of these gods, but like Apis was one of their primary, primary gods. So they have not only a pantheon of gods, they've got a hierarchy of gods that are going. Okay, uh, your turn, John. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord for there has been enough 
of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the Lord, that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the myrrh were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hand to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of the Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. I love this. This time I've sinned. The Lord is right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Does he mean that? No, doesn't mean that. That's, I, I can't tell you the number of times where I've said those very words to my dad to get out of the spanking. <laughs> I've, I'm wrong. I'm dead. I, you don't even need to spank me. I got it. I have. I understand. This is, this is the biggest false confession there is. And let me just read three verses here. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by his works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for, good, for any good work. We know by his work that he is denying God. Hebrews 12.15, talking about Esau, see to it that no one who comes, no one, comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral, godless person like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. The repentance that he sought was not a repentance to God. It was a repentance saying, I'm sorry that I've lost my inheritance. I'm, I, this isn't God, I'm wrong, I'm just broken, please. This isn't turning away. That's not what he was doing. Second Corinthians 7.10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regrets, without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So, he is looking for us when we sin to be broken, to totally turn away, to turn to him and turn everything over to him. And even though Moses actually says, okay, based on that, based on you saying that, two things, I'm going to stop the hail. God is going to stop the hail. Why is he going to stop the hail? So that you will know that the earth is the Lord's. He's saying, I have the power to turn this on, and I'm going to show you the power to turn it off. But you're still a liar. You're still going to lie because I'm going to raise you up again to knock you down. The flax that was in the bud happened between January and February. And we know that Passover, the final plague, is in April. And so this boxing match, this 10-round boxing match, is lasting months and months and months. There are people who believe that the Nile was turned to blood in July for a lot of reasons. But this is taking place over many, many, many months. And every single round, every single round ends with he sinned again and he hardened his heart. When it says that he sinned again, it's saying that he knowingly went against God's will. He knew who God was, just like Romans said, and he went against his will. 